Okay, this is Jacques de Beaufort. I'm talking uh, with the writer, philosopher, and thinker, uh, John David Ebert. Hey, John, how are you doing? Hi, good. Good. So, um, I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me about uh, your new book, New Media Invasion, uh, which I'm holding right here. Uh, I have also um, really enjoyed uh, Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons, which I wish I had to hold up, but as is the case with my favorite books, I ended up giving it to some a friend of mine because I enjoyed it so much. But look, wait. Um, <laughs> I happen to have a copy. There it is. Okay. Well, what, are, what about the uh, the one in the the interim? We could show that too. Um, yeah, yeah, I have that one here too. As as you as everyone who's a Facebook person knows, I've right. been holding it up for the past five days. So I have not uh, read that book yet. Now I, I just wanted to tell. Um, our audience, whoever that may that be, how uh, I came to discover your work. I, I believe it was around late 2008 or early 2009. I had uh, personally become interested in Oswald Spengler, uh, and it was something to discover that there were very few people uh, around who were thinking or talking about him. And I, I, I think that you were pretty much the top hit on Google with Spengler, and there was a series of really fantastic uh, YouTube videos. Uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and that led also to a number of videos that he had done on Joseph Campbell, and then the movie reviews that uh, you had, would, I, mean, I don't really think they're reviews in the traditional sense, and all of that led very directly uh, to me purchasing uh, your, I, I think it was your second book, uh, Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons, which I was totally thrilled by. Uh, it was completely refreshing approach to material that, um, uh, and especially the way in which you look at contemporary culture is something that I had never seen before uh, from a thinker uh, of uh, such obvious intelligence and uh, thoughtfulness. And so it was a real, uh, I thought it was a real important book um, for me to understand the world that, that we're living in because it, it was unusual. Um, so thank you for that. And here we are uh, finally talking and I guess what I, would, what I would ask you is to just introduce yourself, um, specifically how you came upon the, the approach that you um, employ, uh, which, is, which is very unusual. Um, the connections that you seem to make with these ancient uh, mythic archetypes and structures, uh, and, and not only that, but sort of seamlessly blending that uh, with a great deal of postmodern critical theory, which is, in my mind, which might be limited, very real, uh, or excuse me, very rare. Uh, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I do tend to have an interest in things that are uh, anathema to postmodern critical theory, where you don't find a whole lot of discussion of ritual, symbol, and myth. You find it in a couple of guys like Rene Girard, uh, who is a Freudian, but his ap approach is strictly Freudian, and maybe one or two other guys like Peter Sloterdijk, but for the most part they tend to shy away from the study of religion because they identify it with authoritarian thought systems. Uh, and the whole thing, you know, as you well know about postmodern thought, especially the deconstruction aspect, is, is to break down the authority of traditional metaphysical systems. And uh, most of them tend to be Marxists and they have a, a, a great distrust of any type of political authoritarian systems. And so they tend to identify those modes of thinking with the types of governments that were outmoded in World War II, you know, with the, the authoritarianism of the Nazis. And, uh, and so forth. So they tend to shy away from that stuff. Myself, on the other hand, I have a fascination and have had a fascination in the study of mythology ever since coming across the works of Joseph Campbell back in the late uh, 80s, who was uh, the sunset effect of mythology. He was its, its last uh, firework show. Because after him, there's nothing much going on in that field after that. Uh, much to my dismay, as I found out, because I started off reading all of his stuff and then reading his influences, and that's what led, led me to Spangler. Spangler was a big influence on Campbell. And uh, reading Spangler and then Kant and Schopenhauer and Carl Jung and studying Goethe and mostly steeping myself in German philosophy. And then after doing all of that and then finding out what was going on in myth studies today, I, you know, I just heard crickets. There, there's nothing happening at all in the field of myth studies. And so it yeah. fascinated me to try to find out why that is. Why did the field go quiet after Campbell? Uh, with one or two exceptions, like James Hillman's last couple of books in the, in the 90s, and there was a brief flare-up with, remember all the books about 
care of the soul and the soul this and the soul that in the late 90s. And that's really found it. A, a, a satisfactory uh, explanation? Uh, is something that you've Well, heard? no, not other than a kind of a Spenglerian morphological one, which is uh -huh. to say that with every cycle, it doesn't matter whether it's a civilization, a movement in art. As you know from you know being an artist, you, you look, you study Renaissance art, which climaxes with Raphael and Michelangelo and Leonardo and then begins to crumble with, into mannerism, which is self-conscious and affected and uncertain. And you can... Well, I would, I would say that we're in a mannerist age right now. Uh, yeah, exactly. Our uh, entire civilization is. No, nobody's really sure where to take this. Yeah. And I think yeah. with respect to the field of myth studies, it's something that got off the ground in the last few decades of the 19th century, peaked with uh, Jung in the Arano Circle, which met annually in Switzerland. All these prestigious scholars would come and give the latest, greatest papers on this or that aspect of mythology. And then Campbell was the uh, who caught, Campbell was the the lone American who caught the ball that came across the water, and he really did it I think better than just about any of those other guys. And uh, his his show was the last fireworks show. And then the, you know it's 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 a well that's been mined. It's it's dried up. And yeah. I think uh, I realized that after a certain point, uh, it, it was just about the time I finished the second book on uh, celluloid heroes and mechanical dragons when I began to realize. You know, there aren't any new ideas coming out of the field of myth studies, and I want to go find where the new ideas are coming from, and I realized that they're actually coming out of philosophy, that philosophy is still alive, still transforming and changing, and that there were a lot of exciting new philosophers like Paul Virilio or Peter Sloterdijk or, uh, or the uh, Gilles Deleuze, who's dead now, but uh, his work is fantastic. So I started studying those guys and found a lot of new concepts and ideas that were completely alien to the field of myth studies, and then so I gradually began to start building bridges. After the movie book, I started building bridges between those two areas, so that by the time you get to the celebrities book, I'm starting to integrate postmodern thought into that book, and then with the new media invasion book, it's it's thoroughly integrated, and now that the, the two are hopefully a relatively seamless tapestry of, of references. I, I felt that yeah. way, and I, I felt that you know one of the reasons it was such an interesting book uh, is because there were so many things coming together uh, in it, and you don't see that a lot. Um, it, it occupies a, a very unique niche, uh, and, um, you know, just speaking from my personal experience in ac academia, I am an associate professor at a state college, but I think more significantly I did spend time at California Institute of the Arts and the University of Virginia, um, where this, uh, you know, the, an interest, as an artist, the, the interest in anything mythological or even vaguely spiritual in a way that was not um, uh, somehow working on it rather than working in it uh, was really approached with, uh, you know, symbolic violence. I mean, it was something that you really could not do. Um, if you wanted to have a career, if you wanted to be taken seriously, uh, if you wanted to be a new age artist, which was the pejorative uh, term, um, that just it, it wouldn't happen. And I sort of resisted and um, kept my approach anyways, and then might be um, maybe suffered some consequences from that. But um, you know, I think you always said you, you've got to do what you believe in, regardless, and you've got to make the art uh, or, or the writing that you believe in. So. Um, Specifically, I th when I think of you, I think about the great generalists, people like Lewis Mumford, uh, for example. Um, and I'm wondering today why they're so, first of all, if you could sort of talk about your concept of what exactly it means to be a generalist, if you agree with that, that you might be a generalist. Why they're so rare today and how they could be significant in terms of uh, helping our culture find clarity. Uh, because it's certainly missing in many ways. I definitely am a generalist and approach all this material from the point of view of a generalist, which is to say someone who has some kind of facility uh, with all the basic intellectual disciplines. that you know something about history and the history of art and the history of civilization and the history of philosophy, history of poetry, history of uh, literature, and, know, and you're able to discourse comfortably, maybe not in the kinds of detail uh, as a specialist would be able to in those respective fields. But to be able to discourse comfortably within those fields. And I think part of the problem is that the public intellectual, number one, is an extinct species. Uh, and number two, the main reason for that has to do with uh, the university system emphasizing and putting an, an enormous, tremendous amount of pressure upon its academics to specialize and master this or that area. And so we've gotten more and more and more specialized as time has 
uh, gone along. And specialists don't like generalists because once they're reading somebody who's making statements that are outside their field of expertise, they know nothing about how to pronounce on those statements, so they immediately feel uncomfortable. And um, a lot of that has happened and taken place, and it's discouraged the rise of generalist thinking uh, in general, in a general way. Well, I, I, I would say it's, bad, it's, it's a bad situation it, because it, we've it, got uh, yeah. universities that uh, just don't favor this kind of approach anymore, and as a, the result of that, we don't have public individuals who can tell us where the culture as a whole is moving. Right, and I think in terms of uh, a political decision, um, and we all know, maybe, uh, hopefully some people know, or maybe not hopefully, uh, that uh, it, it can be very political in the ivory tower. Uh, it's sort of a, a poor decision to make politically um, because it's it, it's so bal this the knowledge is so balkanized that if you're out there in the middle of the middle of the field, um, you're not really supporting any anybody's agenda. I found this one time when I was teaching out of school where the, you either had to be a hardcore abstract painter or a hardcore figurative painter, and I kind of do both, and so I didn't help anybody anybody's program, um, and. Uh, and you know, so oftentimes you have to fit into an existing box, and I think ultimately um, we suffer for that uh, because we lose. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance, and we lose clarity. Um, and uh, the, the cult of overspecialization is, is something that uh, is negative. So I'm, you're rare as a generalist, uh, and uh, so we're lucky to, to have you in your work. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not, if I can interject here, like in, an example in my case is that. I don't, I, even though I started out with metaphysical and spiritual thinking and what can generally be labeled and, and tends to be labeled as new age thinking, as you're, you're talking about your experiences in, in art, in my case I started out in that new age background, but see I don't fit comfortably within that because I'm too intellectual for the new age. Right, right. New agers regard me um, as being too negative that because they tend to identify criticism with negativity and they immediately assume but if you're critical about something you dislike it, which as any reader of Nietzsche knows, you know, that's not the case. You can love, the way he loved Wagner, for example, uh, but was very critical about everything he did, but nonetheless was absolutely seduced by the music. Right. So that's a mistake to assume that because someone is critical of something, they don't like it. I'm highly critical of the Star Wars films, especially the prequels, but I absolutely love them and have watched them many, many, many times. So criticism and, and uh, negativity are not, they're not the same thing, and I think New Agers tend to make that mistake. So they kind of turn the other way when I start talking. Then on the other hand, the, the, uh, the academic world doesn't pay too much attention to me, A, because I'm a generalist, and B, because I have a kind of a spiritual orientation, which they misidentify with New Age thinking. Right. So well, assume that, as you said, that your experience in art, anybody who has a spiritual side to them is well, I think the one thing that we can do is, is try to not, not to harp on, on this and, uh, you know, by creating, uh, you know, you know the, maybe the one the good thing that we, we can do through the virtual cafe uh, system is to create like-minded um, communities. And um, certainly, I, I, you know, I know how confident you are in, in respectively are with our work and ideas um, and I think that you know people do come around um, the new age seems to be focused on a, maybe it's something that's therapeutic and maybe that's the, the way that I it's read it, it and so the the, the, the the skeptic maybe doesn't have a place in in the new age um, because uh, a lot of people who go into that are people who have been emotionally damaged right one way or another, and they and they flock to that looking for healing. A guru. To find somebody who's uh, who's critical. Uh, they they identify it too much with what caused their psychological wounds in the first place. So that, I think that's that's kind of what happens. Why they don't want that type of critical intellect involved in in their feeling better process. It, it could very well be. Um, and well, to their credit, uh, you know. The, they're willing to go places that uh, thinkers in academia are not willing to go. So it, to, to have somebody such as yourself who's willing to do all of the above, um, I, I think is something very special. So how did this book come about? And if you wanted to give a brief introduction on it, how did you come to write this? How does it um, relate to the other works that you've done? How does it bring the project forward? Um, and uh, what was your impetus for creating it? Well, uh, the book that I had written just before it was the book about celebrities, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, and that book is all about how uh, it, it studies the post-World War II development of the descent of the human being into all this new electric media, because 
uh, electronics, uh, as you know, was invented during World War II. It's something that came out of World War II, uh, out of the